Hi, this is Paul Neal at Pen Productions, and here's a quick tutorial on how to do blend box mapping. I've done this before, it's on my YouTube channel. Uh, this time I'm going to be doing it on a vase, and uh, we're going to be showing a, a couple of uh, techniques here for uh, developing a vase that looks much like this. What's in the background was the uh, completed shader that uh, uh, created this vase, and we're going to uh, break this down into steps to uh, take a look how it's done. Neil Blevins is the champion of this, and uh, probably one of the best at it. He goes about it a little bit differently. He's got lots of tools built around this, and you can check on Neil Blevins' website, and you can find more information about this and, and find out he, how he does it. So we're going to start with this vase model. It's uh, fairly basic. Uh, I modeled it quickly. It's a uh, lathe. I've got a, an edit, uh, spline and an edit poly in here to show changes uh, when we get down to the shader being finished. The handles uh, are just a simple sweep modifier with the turbo smooth on top and some edit poly to shape them and put them in place. So it's a very simple scene. Ground plane right now is in here to be able to get some reflections and whatnot. It has a matte shadow material on it. I'm going to hide that to start with, so uh, we really don't uh, need that uh, in the scene at this point in time. The rendering engine that I'm using is Mental Ray. Uh, I'm going to turn off a couple of things I had for the final render, like the photon mapping. And uh, for now, I'm just going to turn off the uh, final gather as well, just to speed up the uh, test renders uh, so we can uh, quickly see uh, some feedback on uh, how it's working. So if I hit render on this model, it's uh, just green and purple at this point in time, and uh, we'll go from there. So first off, I'm just going to grab both the objects, and I'm going to start with a new tab. And in the new tab, I'm going to create a mental ray arc and design material, and we're going to build it from that. I'm going to right-click on it and say assign material to selection so that now we actually have a gray object. From here, we're going to start with a few textures. So the textures we're going to be using are going to be these four here. And uh, we can uh, just drag those all in. And I'm using Faststone Image Viewer. I find it's excellent. It's free as well, so it helps. And we're going to start with this metal texture. So this metal texture is just uh, sort of a basic uh, rough metal texture. And we're going to apply this into the model. So if I apply this on and hit Render, you're going to find it's not going to look too good. Uh, it's not going to be so bad, actually, on the lathe model, because the lathe model was round, but the handle's probably got nothing on them. It's just going to be stretching all over them and whatnot, and it's not going to look very good at all. So what we need to do is we need to set up UV coordinates to get this to work. Now, I don't want to unwrap this model. This could be a very complex model with all kinds of nooks and crannies and stuff and pieces. Maybe it's multiple pieces. Maybe it's a really large scene with lots of objects. And the problem starts coming in that are you going to unwrap all of this stuff when you want something you know fairly generic but detailed in the same thing so we are going to add UVW map modifiers to this now we're going to add three UVW map modifiers and the reason we're going to add three of them is we want them actually in separate map channels in this case we have map channel one and this is going to represent I'm going to rename it an X direction so we're going to set it to align to X and I'm going to turn off real world coordinates so you can see now that it's being placed on in the X direction on the model. Now note, these models have had their X form reset via the uh, reset X form utility and uh, uh, collapsed into the stack in the case of the vase. The handle is actually uh, um, still has the X form in place. So there's one put on there. Uh, we're going to add another one. And this one is going to be in the Y, and it's going to be in map channel 2. So it's actually going to apply the coordinates into a separate channel of mapping. And again, we're going to rename this. We're just going to say Y so that we uh, remember what we're talking about. And again, I want to add another one. And we're going to do the same thing. It's going to stay in Z. It's going to be in channel 3 this time. And let's just rename this to Z so we have something to reference. So now we actually have mapping coordinates in, in three different channels. If I hit render on this again now, we'll see that the mapping is using currently in the material map channel 1. Map channel 1 is currently the X, so it's being pushed onto the side of the model and through the side. The other thing we want to real world again on for the, uh, or off, sorry, again for both the uh, Y and the Z. Now, what we want to do is we want to make sure that these mapping uh, are all the same size, so the texture is not being stretched in one way or the other, depending on which way it's being put on. So I'm going to uh, connect them all together really quickly. I'm going to open up my uh, dope sheet, go into my material, just go into X here, 
and find the length and I'm going to assign a controller to it as a Bezier float. And that Bezier float controller can then be uh, copied and instanced through the uh, modifier panel or through the uh, dope sheet if you like. So I'm going to right click on here and say copy animation where I put the controller. Right click down below and say instance. And I can do that now to each of these. I can say instance, instanced, instanced, and instanced again. So now when I change any one of these, all of them are being adjusted and they're all the same size. This way I can use nice square maps if I have them and uh, know that I'm not stretching them and I know that they're the same size being placed on. Now I'm going to set this up so it's about the right size encompassing the model and make sure it's encompassing at all axes. It looks like it is. And I can hit render again, and of course, all I've done is just stretch the X out larger, so I'm going to get a nice stretch along the uh, Y and the Z, and it's not going to look very good uh, down the sides, obviously. So let's do a little bit of building up of the texture. So back to the shader. So the whole trick here is, I'm just going to move these out of the way. The whole trick here is is to be able to apply this texture map at three different ways. And we're going to apply them in three different ways by changing their map channels to X, Y, and Z to correspond with our UV coordinates that we've applied to the model. We need to blend these all together, and to blend them all together, in this case, we're going to use a composite map. Composite maps, uh, and I'll attach to layer one, so a composite map isn't necessarily the fastest solution. For those of you who know the difference, uh, mix maps are much faster than a composite map. But they don't have the flexibility, and they're also a little bit more nodes you've got to deal with when you're setting up. So I'm going to do this just with the composite maps. I'm going to make two new layers, and I'm going to pipe each of those into layers 1, 2, and 3. So that's X, Y, and Z. Now when I do a render, of course, what I'm seeing is, is just a stretch down from the top, effectively, and nothing else. So it's, it's not going to look very good at this point. So I want to set these to X, Y, and Z, which is one channel two, and uh, y, Z being channel uh, three. And we're going to connect up the composite map into the arc design. And we can hit render then. And we can see what we've got now is just stretch from the top. So you can see the sides are being stretched all around. That's because the composite is just simply layering one on top of another and not doing anything special. Uh, just like in Photoshop, if we... Uh, um, put together layers. The top layer just sits on top of the bottom layer. We don't see any of the ones below. So we need masking. That masking is going to be in the form of fall-off maps. Now fall-off maps will, will, works by looking at the curvature of the surface and will uh, apply a black to white um, gradient across the surface based on whether or not those uh, polygons are facing something or facing perpendicular to something. So we're going to mask this out. Now we don't need to put a mask in layer one because it's obviously the bottom layer and we don't need to mask nothing. We need to mask layers two and three onto and down to the bottom. So we're going to start with layer two mask and the layer two mask is going to be a fall off map and that fall off is going to have colors. By default, the colors in the fall off map are actually falling off from black facing to white on the side. We want the exact opposite. I'm just going to flip that over. And because this is the Y mapping, we're going to say local Y. And I'm just going to copy this down, put it into uh, the next mask, and make this local Z. And it's already had the colors flipped. And now when I do a render, we should see that the texture comes out mapped from three angles, but blended together so that there's no seam showing. So just box mapping won't get you the same result because it will produce nasty seams where the faces suddenly switch from being facing the mapping coordinate to facing another one. So uh, this one is actually blending those together and blending the sides together nicely. Now we want to get a little bit fancier. We want to start uh, working with this and, and making it look a little bit more interesting. I'm going to pull the fall off maps down and out to the side here because I'm going to reuse those over and over again. And we can start working with these. Now another thing I might want to do is resize these maps. And I'm just going to right click and say show all and go in and open up the parameters and find the U tiling and add a an, uh, Bezier float. This is basically another way of instancing uh, controllers across objects and so I'm just going to make sure that they're all the same.
by instancing them together. So now when I change this, I can change them all. So I can take that down and make this metal texture a little bit larger texture if I want. Um, or I could make it smaller just by clicking on it. Now another way to do that would have been to go in and actually change the length and width here in the actual mapping. But that's changing all of the textures that are going to be applied here. And I may only want to do this one. So I'm going to leave this as an ability to uh, change this up at will and, uh, and make you know, effective changes to it. So we want to start layering together and working with and adding in some of the other texture. So some of the other texture, believe it or not, was um, adding in some cracked texture that looked like uh, paint being layered on top. Now I'm going to use this map here for that, and I want to layer this on top. So same thing, I'm going to have to actually blend this together the same way we did here with the composite map. Now that that map is uh, linked up with those three, we make sure that they're all on channels one, two, three again for X, Y, Z. And of course we can reuse these fall off maps because they just need the exact same result. Now that I have these, uh, these put together, same thing I can put together as controllers for sizing to make sure it's nice and easy. So with those all hooked up, we can size them quickly and easily. I want to blend these two together, bring these two together and uh, start creating uh, you know, the effect of paint layered on top using these as a mask for here. So we need another composite map. And that composite map, I want to hold down control and drop it onto the output of the original uh, diffuse texture and then choose layer one and create a new layer for this. This new layer is going to be masked out by this texture. Let's just check it first and see what we're getting on the model. So I'm just going to drop it right on there, right into the diffuse channel, and then do a render. I just want to see what it's like, what it looks like, what the size of it is, uh, how much noise there is. I want to make this texture quite harsh. This is chipped paint where paint has fallen away, so I don't want a lot of grayscale values in there. I kind of want to make it uh, you know, a specific size too, you know, that I'm getting uh, just enough in the right places. So this is a good way to being able to check that out. So I'm going to uh, color correct this right here and I'm going to go in and open up a uh, color correction node and apply it. And eventually it's going to get pumped back in as the mask. And we can push the contrast on this to make sure that we don't have a lot of grays. And we could use a brightness to choose how much that we're looking for. So I'm going to crank that contrast right up. And maybe even take the tiling up a little bit more to see where I'm getting the blacks and the whites. So you can see now I'm getting a lot of black, very little white. Might not be what I'm looking for. I could go the other way. I'm getting lots of white because white is going to represent wherever the paint is. Black is going to represent the opposite. So I'm not sure. I'm, I'm thinking the white might look more like the, uh, the crack sort of surface we're looking for. And the color correction, I'm going to say invert. And we'll take that size back up the other way and see what we get. And you can see now maybe too much. A, you know, uh, too big a size, maybe too much as far as the white goes. I can bring that back down. There we are, getting some nice cracked areas now, some nice worn areas in the uh, in the model, some nice randomness. Let's look, uh, find out what that looks like with some paint on there. So I'm just going to pipe the uh, composite map back in. And I'm going to hold down Control and Alt just to slide this entire tree back out of the way. And for the color, I'm going to use just a simple noise. And the noise is going to be a couple of greenish colors. And I'll make the second one a little darker. And maybe a bit of a smaller noise, maybe some fractal, maybe even pull it together a bit tighter. And let's see what that's looking like on the model now. And if we're getting nice cracked areas. So probably not getting as many cracked areas as I like. The noise, uh, noise size is a little uh, large still, so we can... Uh, just break that up a bit more. Now we want to play around with this map some more and just see what we can get as far as getting some nice cracked surface areas. So here's our worn surface coming up. It's starting to look pretty good. I think the uh, text, the colors are looking a little off to me. I'm going to darken those up maybe. 
and make it look a little bit nicer, hopefully. So now we've got our cracking, our, our sort of our, our paint chipped areas coming up. What we're looking for now is to get some cracking going on. So same thing, we want to be able to set this crack map up. It looks like this cracks here. And we want to have it set up exactly the same way. So I'll go ahead and do that. So once again, I have a setup with the uh, uh, Bezier Flow Controller controlling the uh, tiling of them. I've got uh, my composite node, and it's masked out by, of course, the falloff maps. And we're going to layer that on top of all of this and make sure it sits on top. So I'm going to add a new layer. I'm going to pipe this into the uh, um, layer 3 here. And we're going to put that in as a multiply on top to multiply in that texture, those cracks. And I'm going to make them a little bit smaller and just uh, so I'm going to tile it up a little bit. Just move that out of the way. And we also want to mask that out and make sure that those cracks only end up where the paint is. So I can just bring that mask back down. So now it's actually showing all in that one area and it's cracking that up. Now this map could also get color corrected if I want. It looks pretty good as it is, but you can also again go and color correct it and push that map and, and get it to look a little bit better if you like. Let's see what the result starts to look like here. So now we're starting to see uh, cracking. And again, it's, uh, it's being multiplied in and uh, might be better if it was actually black and white. So let's get color correction node drop it in holding down control and we can say be monochrome and let's push up the contrast we've got an error in that map where it doesn't uh, uh, tile very well but now you can see that it's really coming up with cracks and we might want to make those cracks even smaller by tiling it up a bit more and getting them to blend look a little more natural now this is one of those things where this is where um, composite nodes are nice. We have an opacity, so I can pull that down a little bit and just make those uh, those cracks a little softer, a little uh, less uh, uh, obvious, uh, so it's not so harsh on there. Not liking the uh, the, the transition uh, that I'm still getting from this mask. It looks like the uh, it's not quite quite as harsh as I would like for some reason on this pass but we can, uh, we can keep playing with it and uh, see what happens and try and get sort of harder areas uh, transitioning from one to the other. So I think I see where I'm going wrong. I'm going to try actually instead of a, a color correction node, I'm going to hold, uh, start moving the node, pull down Alt and pull it off, and then just um, add a, an output map instead. So I'm going to add an output and make sure it's piped through all of them. There we go. And in the output node, I'm going to enable color. I'm going to invert it again. I'm going to set it maybe down tiling around there. We'll see what happens. And uh, I'm going to add a couple of, couple of new vert, um, you know, points on the curve here. And I'm going to crank it up like that. And I think I can get it harsher uh, than I was getting, uh, much sharper edges than I was getting uh, with the uh, contrast spinner and probably going to get a better solution this time. I'm going to have harsher uh, fall-offs on it. So I've got these nice, nice pieces. So it's, I don't have all that blending going on that I was getting before. And the more I pull it down, the more metal texture that I'm getting as I clip it off. So now you're getting this nice wear spots in places that's randomized over the surface. So there we go. That's uh, looking much better now. I'm going to close those down, and we can then pump this into, uh, you know, and, and try a couple of things. One, we're going to want uh, a reflection color map, so I can push that in there, and again, probably one of the uh, best ways to control this would be a color correction, and we could color correct this node to be a little bit better for our color correct here, our, you know, reflection color map. So that might be one of those things where maybe more contrast is better, you know, maybe it should be brighter, maybe it should be darker, we'll have to see and play with it. Again, we may want to build a whole new um, texture uh, path just to be able to control how much spec we're looking for in any given area. And maybe the paint shouldn't be as, um, um, you know, uh, 
as uh, as glossy as the the metal part uh, should be. You know, maybe the uh, metal part shouldn't be as um, uh, glossy either. So you can only do so much with um, you know a, a node like this. You're just kind of getting your your best guess out of it. So I'm losing the nice highlights here, and I'm going to leave it back up again maybe like that. Now we're also going to want to uh, work on getting a bump map going. Now we could try by putting this right into the bump map. You're going to see that it's completely the wrong way around at this point in time. It's in fact uh, you know getting bump pushed out from the bottom layer and the paint's not being bumped out. So we're going to need another composite map. We're going to need uh, to have one out here. And we're going to need to pump in all of the new connections and know that what we're doing is going to work. So I want to put it into bump. I'm going to actually know that the uh, bump value should probably go up a bit and uh, we're going to see if we can build something that's a little bit better. So the metal texture should go in and should be at the bottom. Now this should be much darker and again color, co uh, color correct can uh, help us out a lot here. I'll just drop that in and this color correction node is going to pull this down and maybe even pull down the uh, overall contrast and just get some of that loose texture going in for the uh, bump on the bottom. And then we want the uh, paint coming in and it's uh, uh, showing up and, and bumping where it's, it can be bumped out here. And we want to mix these together a little bit and, and have this you know, sort of mixed in. So I'm going to put this on top and of course again we're going to mask it so we've got this masked area and we can then see what that looks like with a color correct node. So I'm going to pull that color correct node off and just drop it back on top of our um, on top of the noise. And we're going to take these back up and I'll take them and I'll say monochrome because it's bump anyways. So we can even say monochrome here just to make sure. And I want to get some of that texture in there. We're going to give it uh, just a little bit of uh, a texture going on, maybe not so much noise. Uh, and we'll so I'll just flatten it out a little bit with the uh, contrast again, but it's going to be brighter. And so it's being uh, dropped on top here. And then we've got these cracks uh, that are uh, being placed in here. And those cracks are going to have to be mixed on top again as well. And we'll use the same mask uh, here. Oops, same mask here for those. And we can see now those cracks are in there and starting to give us a nice bump texture on top. So this is going to start giving us that little bit of more dimensionality to the, the surface, to the to the cracks, to the paint feel like it's standing up off the edges. It's going to start breaking up the uh, highlights a bit nicer and it's going to make it look a little bit better all around. So this is already starting to uh, you know develop into a shader that now can be placed on all kinds of objects quickly and easily just by dropping it on. We also want to add in a little bit more. We want to get um, in this case um, another layer and this is going to be a sort of a dust layer that's dropped down from the top. So I'm going to go to our composite map uh, that goes directly into our diffuse and in our composite map I'm going to drop in the the map from the top. Now I'm not going to bother with three different ones here and try and blend it around the surface. Uh, I'm just going to use this in channel uh, three which is the Z from the top just pushing down on top of the model. What I don't want is I don't want it on both sides so I won't show map on back off so you have to turn off tiling to get to that and then be able to uh, turn that on. So this will now allow me to be able to have dirt coming down on top. So when I render, you're going to see that the very top is completely plastered with this dirt. It's not quite what we're looking for. What I want to do is I want to blend it out on the edges and have it blend nicely using the Z. So now it's going to blend out. And we've got this even dust. So we want to break this dust up now and we want to actually break up that uh, that alpha channel a little more and, and mix something else into it and we could do a couple of ways. One of the things ways we can do this is by using a mask map right on our actual input uh, of our uh, texture coming in from the top. So I'm going to go in and grab a mask and uh, we'll drop that on into the mask channel and then the mass for that is actually going to be just a noise again. So let's use just the 3D noise and we'll probably pull the size down, give it some fractal, 
tie them together and make the black a little bit gray so that it uh, isn't completely going away and it's going to break up our uh, texture a little bit more. It's going to start just breaking down that, uh, uh, that, that dust sort of layer. Now it's still pretty harsh, it's still pretty strong on there. We can control the overall strength of it by pulling out down the opacity and just having a dust thin dust layer over top to just subtly give us that idea that there's some dirt that's been falling down on it and it's been getting changed in its color uh, uh, from the top. So there you go, you got some uh, dust kind of coming down on. This of course should also change the spec level and this is one of those cases where the spec may need to have some adjustments made to it um, by having its own composite map being placed into the reflection channel so that we can control that this would be darker. Anywhere that the dust is landed shouldn't get be getting that spec change to it. So that'll be the next stage again. So our, our texture is starting to get um, fairly large here. Our shader is starting to get fairly large. Uh, certainly not as large as they can get by any means. Um, the next thing we want to do is we want to try and highlight the edges. We want to lighten the edges around where there's, there's you know, tight curves being made. Again, I'm going to use my um, composite map here. I'm just going to get another layer in. And this layer is going to then be an AO map. And fortunately in Mental Ray, uh, currently we don't have a curvature map, which would have been really, really nice. There are plugins out there that can be found though to do the same thing without having to use an AO pass. So I'm going to drop in a Mental Ray Ambient Reflective Occlusion. I'm just going to close it because I don't need all the settings. And the Ambient Re Reflective Occlusion allows me to be able to do just that ambient reflective occlusion. Usually what it's doing is it's picking up the crevices, the, the, the dark areas, uh, the pits of a model. What we're going to do is we're going to flip it over to an inversion and we're going to flip over the um, uh, colors as well so that the opposite way around. Uh, we're going to set it up so that it's uh, maybe about 8 and 8 on the spread and the uh, max distance and we're going to see what it does for us. And it's going to just render off black and white effectively at this point. Uh, so, because uh, it's just sitting on top and being blended in. You can see it's picking up all these edges. We can also turn the fall off and pull the fall off down. And maybe um, somewhere around a 0.6 or something, it's going to start pushing it into the blacks. And we're going to start getting some blacks going. I'm going to take the, maybe the uh, max distance down a bit. And it's starting to uh, to pick up. Still a few of them, but the highlights are being nice. So let's then use again on the ambient reflective occlusion, we can try a color correct. And we can push the contrast up and see what we're getting. Really what we want to end up is with black uh, with white edges so that we've got some, uh, some nice uh, edge, edge pickup sort of be happening here. See that we're picking up some uh, values still. And we're going to have to work with those. So that looks fairly well adjusted. In the composite node now, I'm going to set this to be a screen. And then just pull it down a little bit. So it's pulling up those edges. And it's being screened on top, just like you would in Photoshop, to lighten something using uh, you know, whites or highlights. Those whites and highlights now are picking up edges and just giving another breakdown of color and changing up the edges and making them show up a little bit more. Now we really, really want to break that down even more and make that uh, come up and broken because right now it's actually quite clean the way it's being done. And again, we can use um, you know something to break that up and mask it out a bunch. So let's use the uh, mask channel of this and we'll throw in, we can use marbles or noise again, we'll use a noise and the noise we're going to uh, break it up quite harshly. Uh, so we're going to go with um, probably a much smaller size I'm guessing. We're going to clamp the colors together. We'll even go with a turbulence maybe. So anywhere it's white is going to show this and we can now see whether or not we get a little bit of break up on those uh, edges and uh, giving us still a highlight but not uh, just perfect. Now again here's one of those cases where you may not be able to see this very well and know what you're getting so the best thing to do is is to test it and we're just going to again we're going to bypass the uh, um, composite right into the diffuse and we're going to render this map across the surface to see where we're getting it uh, showing up. 
I'm not sure if I like the patterning that, it, the patterning that it's using. Uh, so we could use something other than a noise and uh, try something other than noise in here. So let's go and grab maybe a cellular and we can flip flop the uh, two values and it starts giving us a more of a cellular breakdown. We can also say chips and chip sizes. And let's see what those chip sizes look like. And so again, anywhere it's white on the edges will then show um, this, this uh, lightning effect. So here we've got those chips kind of coming up and it's going to give us you know, a fairly good breakdown of where that might be. So let's again repipe the composite node back in so that we've got the full texture happening. And I'm going to uh, zoom this up a little bit closer and we're going to render just around that edge to see what that edge is going to look like and see if we're getting a nice breakup of that edge. The advantage of texturing this way is that we can easily use uh, these textures on more objects and changes to this object very quickly because none of them are based on an actual coordinate system. They're just uh, in there as, as you know, mostly procedural but randomized textures over the surface. I'm going to go in and actually crank the uh, bump map up a bit higher and see what happens. We probably want to uh, put this breakup on the edges into the bump map as well. And uh, we can start getting you know, a bit more of effect uh, in it. So now we're starting to see uh, you know, a little more um, pitting and whatnot. So I may have the bump too high. But it's starting to look pretty good. So let's go back to a camera view and let's do a full render of this. So now you can see this is really starting to look like a nice mixed up texture. It looks, you know, very randomized. It, you know, it looks like it's had some beating done to it and whatnot. Edges are starting to be lightened off a little bit. Uh, so that looks pretty nice. And it's pretty easy to be able to adjust and change these values and work with them a bit more and, and, and get different sort of variations on it just by varying some of these textures and varying some of the, uh, the sizes and values and whatnot. Now here's where the real, um, advantage lies is that I'm going to go back and I'm going to grab this and uh, the, the pot part of it and I want to turn on the changes that I made which add a whole bunch of changes to it. So your art director looks over your shoulder, your client says, hey, that's not quite the pot I'm looking for. Can you make changes? But you've already unwrapped and you've already done all these texturing. You've put on highlights around edges. You've taken the time uh, to darken the pits or whatever else, things of that nature. And now there's a change been called on it. Well, this change has just been called on it. I don't need to touch the texture. And when I go back and render it, the shader now is handling all of those changes for me. It's looking at those outer uh, edges and it's lightening those. It's giving me nice little sort of uh, fallen areas. It's giving me, uh, you know, the, the dirt on top of the uh, of anything that it needs to be on top of. And we get a really nice shader out of it. So we can then uh, unhide the ground plane. And with the ground plane, you can see that it's uh, it's still rendering uh, in the uh, textures. I've already got one set up. This is a matte shadow material and the matte shadow material is going to get pl placed on the ground. And in the matte shadow material, you want to go into the camera map background and make sure that the alpha value is at zero. Uh, this is important uh, with it. It's not defaulted that way. So now when I render this, it will come out and it'll have reflections on the uh, ground um, and it'll cast shadows in the whole works so that we can comp it into another image. So here's the end product. And again, we could apply any object or any new objects to this and get the same result out of it. Thank you very much.